Main Hustle Media podcasts are recorded on the ancestral lands of the Chumash, Tongva, Karankwa, and Hohokam people. And I wish to pay my respects to the people of those nations, both past and like present. Uh, hey, y'all. Hey. Welcome to the Queer and Far podcast, a travel podcast from a couple of queer femmes, providing tips and resources to travel safely while black, brown, queer, disabled, or from any marginalized group and intersection in between. I am one of your co-hosts, Sir Auntie Charmaine Fury, a.k.a. The Blazing Blurred, and I am joined by... Still shenanigans, and I'm still a noob. Hello, Internet. <laughs> Welcome back. Also, it's been a while. It's been a minute, yeah. Like, we, we... I mean, we did record something near the end of um, December, but it's still, it's been, still been a little bit. And I just lost my note for... The thing that I'm going to talk about today. There we go. Hi. Hey. Uh, Hi, friend. I'm tired and same stuff. Same. Internets, how are you? Hello. It's the beginning of 2023 and already. I know. <laughs> fucking exhausted. We only have 60 days. I know. Today it's is the 60 day. Like the day, day we're recording. Today is 60 days. Um, yeah. So. I'm super excited and I'm scared that I, I'm like, I have lists for lists. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm the scared part right now. Well, I know that there's tons of stuff to be nervous about not speaking the language. Well, you know, like at, at all enough, whatever, starting from, starting from like baby level intelligence and stuff like that in a language, all that kind of stuff, not knowing them, all that kind of stuff, all that stuff. Yes, I know. I know I have that to be nervous about. But what I'm currently nervous about is that I have barely scratched the surface of getting rid of shit. Like, I've given away tons of bags of clothes, six big boxes worth of books, and my house is still chock-a-block full of shit. Isn't it amazing how much shit you're like, I don't have much stuff. And then you, like, go through it and you're like, I have too much shit. Because we got rid of so much on our move from, from L.A. to here that it fit into two of those U-Haul like wooden crate things yeah most of it is still in boxes since we got here because we just don't really have a layout that accommodates some of the stuff that we have and now that we're trying to move move like like today was kind of a rough day for tristan because we were getting rid of a lot of his books and some of his books were worth hundred like the book it's was single book was worth like a couple hundred dollars right but we got like less than two hundred dollars for we got like 130 for everything and we're talking about six bad six huge boxes of a books of books mostly uh, philosophy books and and textbooks and things like that all those expensive 300 hundred dollar books and we only get what you get one third of that not even one third of it, one fourth of it, one fifth of it, and eggs are still a dollar an egg. <laughs> well, we actually got eggs today, and I, I asked because I don't eat them because I, well, I like egg whites, but I don't like yolks, so I don't really eat eggs. But he eats a, a lot, so I was asking, I was, I was like, are they more expensive than normal? Are you noticing that? He's like, I don't know, they're close to six dollars. And I'm like, is that how this, this particular kind you get normally costs? And he's like, I have no idea. I never pay attention to that kind of shit. So... I know we use a very specific type of egg because of the the way they treat their animals and stuff like that, but I have no idea if it's more expensive. It is. Just okay. Lunch. Just lunch. Why is that happening? I don't know. There was a oh, internet. <laughs> there was a apparently like an avian flu that went by and they had to kill a whole bunch of birds. That's what they're ah. claiming. However, in Car uh, Kitty Porter and all her glory and, and a lot of uh, people looking into it, the reports have come out that all these places that sell eggs to us um, from this year to last year, their profits are up 65 percent. Which means that nearly 54 cents of every, like, literally, this is like a dollar an egg, which means f 54 cents is just profit. Mm. So, ladies and gentlemen, Get it America chicken. don't care. And er if they'll let you, they'll, it's illegal. But anyway, if you're in certain metropolis, certain areas, places, like, yeah. Yeah, like, this is why it's so important, guys, to like work locally and as do co op possible. stuff because co -ops, yeah. this shit is coming. America don't care about you. Yeah. So we got to figure this out. That reminds me of something I saw on the Tickety Talks. I think it was the Tickety Talks um, where I think it was Sweden also. They um, they were starting to notice a lot of food waste in their, in their trash. So they offered everybody in the country three chickens for free. Yes. Yes. If they took it, they could just get the chickens or whatever. And because of food scraps and stuff like that, the chickens will eat your food scraps. Mm -hmm. So it cut down 
mm-hmm. food waste across the entire country, even though they said like maybe 20% of the population or something like that actually took, took the them chickens. Up on the yeah. yeah, like it wasn't a huge part of the population. Mm-hmm. I mean, significant. Like if your whole mm-hmm. government is like, hey, 20% of the pop, like that's still pretty significant to me. Um, but people reported that they actually like were happier because they had the chickens to look after and um, their food, their food scrap waste went down tremendously. So, um, and um, the chickens, cause you have to usually how you do it. He's like, yes, you have a pin, but it's even better if you have a pin that sort of moves around so that they pick things off the ground. Cause they take care of pests. They Mm. take care of bugs. Mm. So, you can't let them like free range, free range because of predators. Yeah. You know, cats, hawks, dogs. Stuff we like that. house sat for a friend years ago. Um, uh, their house I used to refer to as the house of the animal rejects because they were the kind, <laughs> kind <laughs> they were the type of gay people who collected every animal that they ever found, <laughs> no matter what. Three legged goat? Yes. Chicken or turkey with a, burnt, a bent neck? Uh huh. Guinea um, pig with bronchitis. You know, Get like here. cats with a, that were senile. No. Um, you know, all kinds of stuff. They had this like twenty six year old Great Dane who should have been dead years before. Twenty six. She was so old, so so old looking, but she also had old dog smell. You know that like that really really old dog smell. Sweet thing had um, tried to calm down the senile cat and uh, ended up pancaking it because one of the partners was in the hospital during a time. And so when they came back, they just found the dog on top of the cat. Cause he was trying to, or she was trying to calm it down. So anyways, they had a lot of, do- they had a lot of like blind and deaf dogs, whatever. So we house sat while they were in Greece for a month. Um, so that we could keep the animals alive, which we did for the most part, but the chickens that they had, they had chickens and, um, turduckens. Do you know turduckens? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, turducken is the food thing. That's Not, a food thing. You're talking about. Oh, okay. I thought it's the hybrid turkey, uh, turkey chicken. I forget what they're called. Turkins. 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 Um, they had four of those ugly little bastards. Poor things. Um, and uh, <laughs> and <laughs> when we're there for like a week or two, one of the chickens is just dead in a, a like a whole bunch of footprints, da, 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 like all over it or whatever chicken footprints and um, and what looked like is probably a fox footprint. But it died. It didn't get bit. It just died. So evidently, they will. They can be scared to death. Yeah. So it just froze and then died where it was. So Tristan buried that because we didn't know what to do with this. So we, when they called to chicken on us, we we're like, "Hey, we had to bury one of your chickens." And they start laughing. They're like, "No, you're gonna lose some chickens. Just throw them in the trash when you're done with them." It's <laughs> like, God damn. Uh, but anyways, yeah. So that's how I learned that chickens are disgusting to keep if you keep a lot, and um, and they because. Poop everywhere they poop like crazy that being said when we moved to massachusetts the people who had lived there previously like years before had had chickens and so but they hadn't touched that part of the ground ever since they got rid of the chickens. so we planted a garden oh. there and mm-hmm. we had very very fertile yes. yeah uh, land where the chicken poop was but you had to like you could smell it every so often when you like yeah. turn turn the dirt it's pretty gross uh, but that's not what we're talking about today um no. That was a little bit of a wee tangent. We're only allowed three. We were, we're only allowed three. Well, then we're gonna be done in like five seconds. Check. We're gonna have to end this show. Check. Okay. Um, so what are we what are we talking about today? Let's. So talk we about- are gonna talk about some random queer and disabled facts from Mexico. So not necessarily Medida where we're planning on going, but just Mexico in general. Um, I have a couple that are semi travel related, and then I have one escándalo. Escándalo. What do you got? Um, I have a bit on um, how Merida and Mexico is faring in the disability realm, which is, you know, competing with America (laughs) (laughs) on their way down to the bottom. Yeah. And this is probably like a direct trigger to when when we tell people we're about to move to Mexico and their initial reaction is that it's not safe or um, what about how they treat lgbtq plus people or what about how they treat disabled people and while it's no surprise to us that what we're learning is it's worse here in the u.s (laughs) statistically statistically speaking uh i don't want to spend the time educating people who already want to naysay my trip so Mm, saving mm -hmm, it up mm -hmm. for 
the show this, for people who actually might have some sort of an interest. Yeah. In because we're not going into this thinking that anywhere we decide to go because Mexico was just the, like, hey, we're going to try this first, right? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. We we're had a whole spreadsheet the, with like oh, all the countries and stuff. We still have the spreadsheet, but we're not under the delusion, guys, that we're going to a utopia. Right, right. Yeah. We're not. We're all we're saying is if it's OK, you're saying it's the same shit as it is here, but cheaper. I can afford health care. <laughs> the food might have seasoning. <laughs> the food might have seasoning or I don't have to. It doesn't have all the extra stuff in it that in most countries find is illegal. You can't. Most of the right, stuff right. that we grow here in America, Things they don't that want. They, they don't ban want. humans from eating or from consuming for human consumption in other countries, yeah. but we eat here. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that I mean, if this probably is going to be a little bit of a shorter. Um, Let's not make crazy promises because we've okay. promised that several times. Internets, we're going to try. We just like to chat. We have no evidence for None. the level of confidence. Like, I know that you're a white and whites sometimes just have confidence oh. in declarations that they make. <laughs> Where? When did this happen? You said um, I'm pasty. But Sorry. yeah, let's not make let's not no. even pretend that we're gonna make this short. We're gonna we can always have the best intentions, but we, we have will the always best fail. intentions. We will always oh. fail. Oh. It's okay, oh. fail. That's how you learn. Uh, yeah. All right, I'm ready though. So which one do you want to start with? Um, you know what? Let's do a little. What about a little back and forth? Okay. Okay. So like, um, so I found a really interesting article actually in the and the uh, yucatan magazine that and this is dated now this is dated uh, um in the 2017s guys mm. um but 2017s like there's multiple sorry but anyway <laughs> but it but it was saying that merida is actually lagging and accommodating in uh, um in the in the handicap that is the actual line merida lags behind in accommodating the handicap advocates say um so um Currently in Merida, and if some of the numbers are, there are about 370,000 370, uh, people who are disabled um, who are willing to work and can't. And, and, can't. Um, and so, uh, it, same issue here in America, guys, yeah. right? Um, they are willing to work or can't work for various reasons. The top two reasons are no one doesn't want to accommodate. Mm. or they're not allowed to because they're they'll lose their insurance or they'll lose their um, oh so they have very similar restrictions and in insurance they have some like they have some stuff whatever now there's other places like in mexico city where um apparently some uh, the elderly and um for the elderly and for uh people with disabilities public transportation is free okay which That's is something. nice they have very, really great trains um bus systems and stuff but that that while that's great it doesn't feel everybody's needs right because what if sure. somebody needs door-to-door -door yeah services seriously lacking in america as well yeah um a lot of times people will say something like well this the city in merida is quoted to be saying this it's a very walkable city <laughs> that there's so people who can't walk <laughs> so. right and then there's people like or it's walkable but the sidewalks don't have access for wheelchairs yeah um or there's flooding or there's different ways in or they'll have a public transit but they don't have the ability to get a wheelchair or um other mobility devices onto mm. Mm. okay so while I was looking at, so uh, while I was looking into some of this stuff, and we'll go back to Merida, um, they were saying that they've been having um, a lot of meetings saying that, you know, the mechanisms for, you know, to have this dialogue, because um, they have a convention for the rights of persons with disabilities in Mexico. There's a big uh, convention that they usually have on a yearly basis, I believe during 2020, that was ex mm. Um But Human Rights Commission of the State of the Yucatan, um, report that the two day meeting, um, over 50 organizations from nine states. So there's a concerted effort there. Sure. Um, the, they say that the Yucatan has a higher than average rate of people with disabilities, but there's no studies indicating why that might be the case. 
Mm. I don't know if it's like better weather. I don't know if that, you know, I, so no, so, so far, according to this, and I even tried to look further into that. Yeah. I couldn't find reasons why there certain seems to be either that or like, I think in some places people are afraid to um, like register a, a, yeah, sure. or either acknowledge or say that they need this because it could detriment. To, yeah. And that makes sense too. I mean, it's, it Trend, happens here. Makes sense because it happens here, yeah. So, um, but yes, yeah, so um, they there's lots of organizations, um, but apparently, just like in America, while we have organizations that are state-run or city-run, because everything is different, right? Depends on where you are. What And that's the most confusing part about it is, who do I, do I talk to the state level? Yeah. Do I talk to the county level? Yeah. Do I have to talk to the city level? Yeah. And then mm -hmm. the county, blah, blah, you know, and it goes down. The list. Yeah. And many times it's just like here in America, it's nonprofit organizations. Yeah. Trying to do the heavy lifting, but they're restricted mm -hmm. and funds are usually the case. Um, they have some progress in place that helps like get people moving around. There's been some conservative efforts there, but um, also the city is older. Yeah. This is hard. Um, it's it a takes... damn near 600 year old city from the time of colonization, let right. alone what existed there before. That, yeah. Right. And, th and, you know, things have settled. Um, there's often, you know, flooding in this and particularly in the Catan, you know, they get a lot of water. Mm -hmm. So, it you know getting things to be modern and inclusive it's not impossible but it really will take in a concerted effort of people who are not just disabled to be like hey we need to make some efforts here yeah. to be included so um let's see here one of the last it's funny things. too because like and you know i don't have this experience but um family members that that you know end up having to look after disabled family members um there needs to be an accommodation for those folks too right like because mm -hmm. they st they also need to work and and pay the bills for everybody but um but i imagine they have very little support as well and so it it seems like it's not just the disabled people but the families of those people also need to advocate for their family member and for themselves mm -hmm. um to give them like maybe the breaks that they need so that they can look after people or, you know, um, some kind of financial support, you know, things like that, that need to, that need to happen anywhere. Right. Anywhere. Like, because, you know, again, the, the stuff that we're used to is because we're from America is the oftentimes there's people with, um, <laughs> people with great intentions. Yeah. Like me, but I, because of my background and, and, and my experiences, I have blinders on how someone else mm -hmm. will experience disability or experience another otherism, right? Yeah. So what happens, I see if they're having the same problem we're having. They have all these groups, but who's running them? Not bodied, most yeah. likely, yeah people with good intentions, people with family members, they, you know, and you're, we're not at the forefront, the same issue that should be happening here is happening there. We really need to be listening to the people who are in the trenches, the ones yeah. that are experiencing the most, because the same magazine wrote another article in 2021, I believe in June of 2021, showing that new reports paints grim picture for people with disabilities in the UK in Merida in particular, saying that 70% of all people with disabilities are unemployed. That's pretty significant. That's very. Um, to make things worse, uh, roughly half of the disabled people with formal employment are underpaid. Okay, that also happens here, guys. Yeah, it also happens here, yeah. Okay, um, many companies like Goodwill mm -hmm. and they get an actual they because everything there's supposed to be a minimum wage mm -hmm. because they're offering you know job placements for people with disabilities they get a waiver from the government saying they don't have to even pay the minimum wage most people with disabilities are making two dollars and 15 cents an hour in the united states yeah okay so um so like while you and i are 
going to be in a different situation there because we're foreigners and, you know, more than likely wouldn't be utilizing any state benefits right. as we maybe welcome in travelers that, that are disabled, knowing, knowing uh, that there's, there's like the physical accommodations of like going to different places. How do we get people places and things like that is, is something that we're, we would need to focus on, yep. but knowing that on the government level and in the culture role level, the way people with different abilities are treated will roll out a lot differently to foreign travelers as well. Mm -hmm. But you and I are also facing a thing where as time goes on, you probably will start experiencing, yes, you know, more and more physical um, difficulties. And we're going to have to figure out how to accommodate you there as foreigners. Yep. Right. Which we and, probably won't start learning until we're there, but it's, right. you know, <laughs> we're and, trying to figure that out for everybody. Um, I, uh, one of our former guests on the show, uh, Quadzilla, um, you know, had to kind of calm down our fears, both of our fears, because we're like, we don't want to go to a place that is accommodating for disabled people if we're, you know, we're not disabled because we're taking a yeah. spot. She goes, I understand. And it's always really important to be conscious of that. Mm -hmm. But you're more able bodied than I am. What happens if I get down there and I discovered that it's yeah. not what so they say it is? We're on recon right now. Yes. And, and any place recon. that we go, which is what's been happening is I've been traveling for the comic cons and stuff that I did last year. Um, it's keeping an eye out. It's mm -hmm. kind of looking to see so that so that as we um, are starting to recommend places, even to travel, or if we put together group travels or something like that, that we would be able to say, we've definitely looked into this thing. That being said, uh, even with a heightened sense of awareness that, that you and I have as more able-bodied than, you know, someone Some. in a wheelchair or something right. like that, um, like, I don't know what I'm missing yet. You know, it's almost like, it's almost like I need to travel with somebody also who's in that situation. Like I need to do the recon ahead of time. Yes. But then I need to kind of go back with somebody too to see like, what did I miss? I think that's really important. And I, and you and I talked about this privately. So we'll let you guys on the internet know that what we would like to do is establish something that we can keep people safe and, and fun, mm -hmm. you know, and, and fed and everything. But we would like to invite some of our friends and family that, uh, from different walks of life, whether that be disabled or disabled and queer or uh, trans and get their perspective, you know, what are we, what did we miss? Yeah. Uh, what can we improve on? What, what's doing, what's getting it right? Um, because that's their experience. And as someone who doesn't walk every day in those, um, in those shoes, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna miss it. Even with my best intent and even yeah. with my best training, to see yeah. this stuff. I'm not, I, I'm not going to see everything. Um, but they were saying that, um, so usually for every, so four out of every nine people with disabilities in Yucatan complete basic education mm. and only, and only one in a hundred actually graduate from a college. Um, they report that not enough is done to facilitate a connection between the private sector mm -hmm. and people with abilities, uh, with disabilities, people with abilities, disabilities. Um, they approach, what they do is they're trying to approach every problem individually and try to say, hey, people with disabilities tell us individually, when the, what they really should be doing is listening to and trying to make something that is more universally used, whether that you're able-bodied yeah. or not. Right everybody should be able to use it which is which is what we kind of got into with quadzilla too the the yes. universal de design where Nine. like um there's that one staircase that we saw a picture of that was a mm -hmm. still stairwell but it also had an embedded ramp through it which you could step on as part of the stairwell or, or it was rampable for for people with wheelchairs and things um so, you know so it doesn't it doesn't make it less accommodating for an able-bodied person. It's just in, no. it's just access for all, like the yes. opening doors at a grocery store. You know, that was another yeah, thing that we talked about. That was about. another thing. So um, while there are some of those types of things I imagine in Medida or any part of Mexico as well, there's going to be things that we're going to discover too. Like 
when people make the argument is that America is somehow better <laughs> of a place to be for disabled people because we have the ADA, um, as a former facilities manager, operations manager at a major, major tech company, um, a global tech company, we had ADA compliance in terms of like how your desk is set up, how the conference room is set up. Right. Um, is there enough room to push a wheelchair through this section or whatever? Are there um, wheelchairs or some sort of wheelchair access, uh, uh, elevator access within a certain amount of every exit and entrance and stuff like that? That was ways in which on a global tech company level, there was accommodations for disabled people. Does that mean that it was easy and accessible across the board to all people? Probably not. Was there failings? Probably yes. We would do like ergonomic evaluations for people's desk setups and stuff like that from time to time and buy them new equipment as as is needed. Yeah. But then there would be arguments of, well, we can't get you this special desk because someone else is going to want the desk just because they think it's cool. Oh, yeah. And so you end up getting this like lesser useful item be, but you're still accommodating them according to different, you know, rules that you have to accommodate uh, disabled folks. But it's not the ideal accommodation. It's the fact that they've accommodated even a little bit. And right. so as Americans, we make this mistake of thinking, oh, no, we, we're taking care of them when we're actually probably not, maybe sometimes making it a little bit worse. Yeah. And we're saying stupid stuff like I can't aid you because a person who doesn't need aid will get jealous. Will get jealous. You know what I'm saying? And that used to yeah. happen all the time in, it does. in the position that I was in. And that's a very small window. So like, because I was a facilities manager and because I, um, I worked in operations, I had an eye for certain aspects of how to accommodate disabled folks. But as a traveler, yeah. I had to learn entirely new ways to keep my eyes open about stuff mm -hmm. because those types of things didn't actually cross over. So like what you're saying, all these nonprofit organizations, while very well-meaning, well -meaning. they don't have anybody actually telling, they're not either listening or they're not accommodating actual disabled people to be parts of their boards or something like that so that we can start hearing what sort of accommodations need to be happening. Mm -hmm. So in our case, we're actively looking for how to be accommodating in travel for holiday travel basically mm -hmm. is is what we've been talking about yeah, a little bit right a little that bit being more. said we also understand that there's a uh, medical tourism aspect of some of the stuff that we've been talking about doing yes. as well and so there's this two-tier thing that we're looking into is not just like could you holiday well could you convalesce well well yes you know stuff like yes. that too so i'm we're still, trying but we'll uh, probably have to get there to make it happen I'm super excited in, in on our way to to um, Merida. We're gonna. I'm gonna stay. Uh, my partner and I are gonna stay one night in Houston, so we can come and take your cats right to mm -hmm. the plane, whatever. I am going to be staying in a medical Airbnb. Yeah, because I would like to see how that is, and um, and they, and I was amazed how many different ob. And I'm like this needs to be more of a thing it didn't even occur to me until like when i when i saw that one and i sent it to you i was like oh they mentioned that you can have long-term covalences here that's a good idea it just kind of like boom it kind of went away it was like it's just a good idea but when you're starting to think about it like a lot of people travel to mexico and um, for dental work in more cases dental is pretty strong and some mexico. surgeries yeah um but like colombia is known for major surgery yes and, and plastic surgery as well and plastic mexico, mexico is also known for plastic surgery yeah but um for medical tourists you can fly from wherever you're at in the united states stay for a month or two at a time to convalesce pay for your surgery even if it's a fully elective surgery all for well, well, thousands and thousands of dollars less than what you would actually end up having to pay if you were to right. do that same thing in the United States. So an aspect of what we'll be looking to and learning, because I did used to work for a, a medical tourism company as well, is kind of keeping our eye out for establishing those relationships. Right. Where we're going to be living. So in, in this this go around, we'll be made at a, um, and try to find like what is the best Mm -hmm. Airbnb for convalescents that we can recommend to someone who says they're coming down for mm -hmm. a medical procedure. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, like a driver who is able to accommodate wheelchair or different kinds of mobility uh, to get you to and from your doctor's right. office and, and, and stuff like that, too. So, yeah, these I'm are like, the things we're 
on our Was lives. it Delta? Well, remember that when they broke her wheelchair and they said, just get an Uber and ask the Uber driver to carry you to your hotel room? And I'm like, could you imagine? Like, I, I for very briefly drove for Lyft when I was in L.A. and like in, unemployed and stuff like that. And one time I had a person who uh, was a wheelchair bound person and uh, I had asked, do you need to sit in the front or back? How do you need me to, to set up the chair? And he said, just push the front seat all the way forward. And he goes, and then don't touch me. And I was like, mm. So, you know, I listened to what they said and then he he collapsed his wheelchair for me and then just told me it was a lightweight one. So he's like, just yeah. lift it and put it in the back. If it was any he- as a lightweight wheelchair, if it was any heavier than that, yeah. I would not have been able to get it into my own car. Right. We well, are regular as people. We're not regu- that are no. driving for Lyft or Uber or whatever, you know. And even even if you you'll get because I would try, attempt to try to help I would but this yeah. person this this person who was in this interview was like I have brittle bones disease yeah you pick me up wrong you're gonna kill me yeah and I'm like this is a valid point you can't you can't just do that. plus the insurance and the Burns- liability in case you do drop a person yeah like how about Delta you don't um, break somebody's People's legs fuck- yeah. um thirty thousand dollars and then only offer them a travel voucher for whatever it's up and can you imagine that your solution to i've i've cut off your ability to to be mobile right is sorry it's i had no and it's it's so it's so because of you know people with disabilities we've been screaming for years help us help us help us and i'm like i'm so and here's me going i'm sorry i didn't know i hate that um now i know and i'm gonna try to do better but like Um, Because I want to get, let's see here. Uh, The report is noting that the Yucatan government has not done enough to facilitate connections between the private side. They're saying that there are several laws, both on the federal and state level, that are intended to help defend the rights of the person with disabilities in Mexico. But the real world implications Mm. is lacking. How does that sound familiar? Yeah. I mean, hello, this is home. And also, like, even the way that these things are managed, like, let's say the government does pass a, a accommodation requirement law of some sort, um, right. implementation, you, basically, it's such a large undertaking that people would l- basically have to report this person, this place hasn't started accommodation yet. You know what I'm saying? And that won't happen. Because why? People don't want to raise a stink. People don't want to be the one who causes the problem, even though they need the accommodation. So there's, yeah, between implementation, communication, and, and actually just like generally planning, planning it in a way that, that is universal and doesn't ma- um, make people say stupid shit like it's taking away from able-bodied people. Um, because first of all, fuck you for that. But second of all, you're stupid. So, and before, because I want to like give this, and I want to give it back to you. So, f- like some some notes here, just to put it in perspective. Now we said seventy percent, and we're only talking about y- Yucatan for right now. But I'm gonna look look at the entire United States. Okay, sixty one percent. So excuse me, sixty seven point one percent of Americans are living with a disability and are trying to work but can't. Is that sixty seven point one percent of all of Amer- Americans are disabled with, or of disabled of, of, people. The, of the people with disabilities. Got it. Okay. Cannot are trying to find work. And it uh, was the big lie. Remember, everyone said no work from home. And then what would we mm-hmm. learn in 2020? Yeah. They immediately like it was so easily accommodating for disabled people. And then they immediately started shutting that kind of stuff down. So right. And this is coming yeah. from the Bureau of Label Statistics people. This is coming from the federal government. And um, it's not just the um, that the the big lie was that people would start to be accommodated more. It's also that um, you can't get a big job because then your benefits will go away. You can't get married in the United States no. as a disabled person because your, your, disa- your disability benefits will go away. I have um, I've had a guest on one of my other shows um, that was will wheelchair bound and trans and their partner was also wheelchair chair bound and i don't recall if their partner was trans but between the medications and the health accommodations for the transness and the medications and the health accommodations for the disability Mm -hmm. 
times two because of the other partner as well. And they can't get married. Yep. And you you could get dinged and lose your disability coverage payments, money, money that you get monthly because you remember you can't work. Okay. Yeah. If you have a car. If you have that's a car. Worth, oh, that's worth over like $2,000. If you're partnered with a fellow dis- disabled person and you die, but your name is on the lease, now your disabled partner is uh, evicted from a home because you yes. also can't have both of them on the lease. Or you might need to have a co-signer of some sort. There's so many ways in which uh, disabled people, and just talking from the experience of, of like anecdotes and stories that I know from here in the United States, um like you're you're fighting death from the system yeah not just whatever your ailment may be that has made you disabled so one of the things that um certain people in america who are on a certain right side of the lane like to say things like people are lazy and they're only faking a disability so they can live and mooch off (laughs) can you imagine how much faking how 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 exhausting that much acting would be well, and also, does every pretty much you have to apply for disability? I know very few people, and this is coming from not just me in my fields. Everybody, I used to do this for a living to help people get insurance to help pay their medical bills when I was working in corporate America, uh, when I had different color hair, um, and it was it literally it took at least three to five times before I could get of applying to disability. of applying. Yeah, they would be denied every single time. So just to get to you guys, I, I'm going to bring up the federal payment. So this is coming from SSA.gov. OK, for 2023. All right. You guys ready? So people are lying to get disability because they can move off the system. OK, <clears throat> so the maximum monthly federal allotment to you for a single person is $914 for an eligible person a month. Okay? Which or, we can all agree is not livable anywhere. Who can who can live off of that? I don't even know if you can rent a room. Yeah. Anywhere. Hmm. I don't you can um it's $1371 for an eligible individual with a s- eligible spouse. So two people are supposed to live off of $1400 a month. Yeah. <laughs> And then, and then if you have a child, you get to have four hundred and fifty-eight dollars per, per child if you are also disabled. Remember how I said that we shouldn't promise that we were going to talk small? We've already talked yeah. forty minutes about this, and we're talking mostly about the United States. This is why we don't make promises. <laughs> and while you guys like, I'm a chatty white woman. Oh, but anyway, but yeah. So, but um, I. I I couldn't find, I'm still trying to look there. It's hard. I I couldn't find the money. I know it's there. They're saying it's there. It's either that I don't know enough how to. How to do the search or it's maybe not even translated into English anywhere. Well, and I mean, if ever I find it, I can just, you know, Google, you know, you click on the thing and you say, hey, make it, make it so I can read it. But anyway, so this has been, you know, it's enlightening. Um, It seems like this is a definite, um, a whole is problematic, but I guess what I'm trying to convey to everybody here is it's America is not, much not than necessarily here. better than, yeah, where, where disability treatment is concerned when it comes to that. So, but in terms of the travel aspect, the way in which we are going to try to, yes, we're going to try to figure some shit out so that when we're there, we can, in, you know, tell people who are who wanting to goes. come out, whether it's for holiday travel or um, medical in, in some way, and, shape, or form. I'm sure I'll ask permission when I get there, but I'm super excited to interview um, my Airbnb host mm. because he went to school to to study um, for you know uh, for uh, equality, uh, uh, equity, and stuff. So he went to school for not only just the arts, but it sounds like he went to school for I believe you know for equal rights he, for human rights. And I'm I'm really fascinated to, to, to chat with him about. Because, I mean, if that's what he went to school for and he lives in Merida, yeah, he's like, going to be a wonderful... Yeah, what does look like there? Right, yeah. what a wonderful resource. He would be able to, hey, if we want to send people down, where, where, show me where to start. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what would, what would help you to accommodate somebody in your, in your dwelling? Because I'm super excited to show his dwelling to you guys. Yeah, because you picked a place that was um, marked as LGBTQ 
friendly. Yes, um, and a safe space. Yeah, and a safe space and, and things like that. So uh, while we won't give any information until after Where? you leave, yeah, <laughs> after you leave. Not before. Don't you um, all be showing up at my door now. <laughs> unless you're bringing tacos. Yeah. Um, which literally, it looks like we're just going to be able to walk outside and... Boom. And there's going to be places... Everywhere. Like, the place that I'm staying at initially, in their description, they say there's a fruit stand around the corner. And a lot of the places I've been looking at also mention fruit stands. So I guess fruit stands are really important um, to the culture. And so it's just like, don't worry, there's a fu- fruit stand around the corner. So it'll be nice to know, like, what kinds of things, accommodations that happen at your place, um, at my place too. Like, I am in a, a ground floor unit of yep. the first place I'm staying. Um, so I'm curious to see how that goes. Um, I know that it's a shower only place where I'm at, which yeah. is tough for me because I want a bathtub, but um, I, I couldn't find, I couldn't find one for enough. I settled place, so. for having my own little, like, little pool. tiny pool in all, the- all the places have little tiny pools and the place in the case of the place i'm staying it's a shared pool shared teeny pool. tiny pool of like four different units or something like that but they're all traveler units they're not um long you know um so anybody go hey guys why aren't you you know staying together two reasons one they're going to be staying there longer than we're going to be there mm-hmm. also they have traveling with animals and cats need time to adjust cats they get don't. real anxious when there's new people around um like i recently had a person staying with me and they were only supposed to stay for less than a month they ended up staying for two months mm-hmm. my cat's personalities all mm-hmm. changed and are now completely different in some cases like the way they are about food because mm-hmm. this person mm-hmm. kept feeding them when i was telling them to stop feeding them mm-hmm. so now they won't get out of my face when i'm eating they're 16 years old I've <laughs> never had them in my face when I'm eating, and now I can't get them to stop, and they're extremely aggressive about it. So that's the reason why I don't tend to like to have people stay with me, although I have let a lot of people stay with me. Right. In this case, the place that we're staying at is also small. I mean, it could accommodate all four of us, but a combination right. of, like, the stress of going to a different country, you haven't had a break in who knows how long. Right. So there's going to be times that you're going to want to be, you know, and it's not here's the thing you were when you were planning this you were planning it all together and i was the one going i don't want to hurt your feelings but can i just your cats might want to i was just thinking to... about it from like the cost saving aspects of it but what you say is makes sense like yeah the the cats need that time to calm down to figure out their new place yeah. um, they're going to be on a plane for the very first time they've yeah. traveled across country multiple times all the cats have that that we have but, but you drove um, them we drove them Two of them are car sick. Who knows how they're going to be on airplanes. And then, um, and, and they're going to be handled like, you know, because their rule on the flight that we're going on is one cat per human, meaning per person, that yeah. m- me and my partner are going to have one and they're going to be like, who the F are you? Yeah. And we're going to have to keep going. It's okay, baby. We're it's here. Okay. You know, don't, don't poop in there, please. They're fi- well, they're going to have diapers. We've already been okay. training one with diapers. She hates them, and her whole personality changes when you put them on there. But she's the one that shits a little, you know, like she's old. I know, she's, she's old. She can't. Poor little yeah. baby girl. But yeah. everybody's going to get them, I think, probably a week before, so I don't completely traumatize all four of my cats. Um, I, like a week before, I will introduce putting a diaper on them from time to time so they don't freak out. Um, but the the young, the young older one, she's had, she's been wearing them on and off here and there. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So there's things that we already have planned, but I guess that kind of segues into some gay shit. Yeah, let's um, do it. Uh, <laughs> uh, I ended up looking, I was really struggling to find like, what is the gay community like in Medida or mm-hmm. just Mexico in general? Like what, yep. stuff like that. And in this case, I, I really wasn't focusing on um, all the stuff that we've already kind of talked about, like, you know, safety and crime and things like that or whatever. It was mostly just like, can people, can can gay folks travel and find community? Right. Was some of the stuff that I was looking at. And um, and so one of the things I found is this uh, website called um, Gay Mexico Map. I like I'll, it. I'll go ahead and pop that up for everybody. I okay. like it. Gay Mexico Map. And uh, what I was excited about, and I sent this to you last night, is it does talk about the the queer community in um, what they call colonial city, Medo, the white city. Um, it has landmarks. It has it has mm-hmm. hotels and Airbnbs that are mm-hmm. lesbian owned and run. Mm-hmm. Um, they let you know that that's the case. There's other ones that are like uh, gay owned be- uh, bread and breakfasts. So there's like this whole list of like places that you can stay that are gay owned, um, queer owned in some way, shape, or form that um, or gay friendly in general. So um, many go go boys. 
a lot of go-go boys things so and then the clubs and the disco so there's a lot of bars and discos and stuff like yep. that um uh drag shows go-go a boys are a big deal um dive bars where the intention mm -hmm. there is to meet for quick hangouts and hookups and Jeez. then there's other places where it's like that's it's just the, not the vibe there you know so like mm -hmm. it's a mixed mm -hmm. bag Mm -hmm. of um things that this this site offers including like restaurants that are known to be queer friendly and or, or gay owned gay owned yeah like gyms like gym spas yoga that's a lot there's a lot of stuff on this site um there's some places that they even they've even updated their site to include places that have cr uh permanently closed down oh, yeah. in case someone finds it on another website and they're like looking for it and they can't find it when they get there mm -hmm. um there's also the Me medita gay tours so there's a Ooh. tour organization that that exists out there for queer folks because we're fabulous so uh so yeah and they actually uh gay mexico map actually has like um tabs for mexico city uh jalisco baja oh, yucatan you know oaxaca and stuff like oaxaca. that so you can um you can like there's some resources and yeah. um and i guess like there's a lot of whatsapp groups as well so a lot of the stuff i was finding oh. is that like there's a lot of whatsapp in the same way that i'm looking for mostly like black expat spaces because that's where i think i'm going to be the more feel more comfortable yeah um there's also a lot of whatsapp groups that are dedicated to um you know queer folks to enjoy their time out there too or or connect with other expats or queer expats or something like that too um so it's like it seems like that there are ways in which you can get access to community pretty easily um there was another site and i accidentally like closed the thing so now i gotta go dig and try to find it again um but it was like a gay travel blog and um and Mexico it was dedicated it was either dedicated to Mexico or the section that I was in was dedicated to Mexico and it did talk about um how pretty much in almost every major city there okay. is a community and place where it's safe now they they still like caution in the same way that you still have to here right. in the United States as well like keep your head on a swivel um if you're in you know a group of people make sure everybody is you know taken <laughs> accounted for and stuff like that you know that kind of stuff can still happen there is anti uh, LGBT mm -hmm. sentiments in some places, you know, and all, you know, everywhere. For everywhere you go, no matter how safe or, or precious the place is, there's probably going to be somebody on the anti side. There's um, an asshole everywhere. Wait, there's an asshole everywhere. Sorry, YouTube. Bleep. So, um, so the, yeah, the, there's a, a number of places based off of some of these websites I find that I've started to pull over into my notes section on my phone so that while we're there, okay. we're going to like, let's go to the lesbian mm -hmm. breakfast place. Let's go to the Airbnb. So that's the other part is because I'm going to be staying there permanent, semi-permanent, whatever we're calling it. You're going to be going back home to the U.S. and then coming back for, say, mm -hmm. a month or so at a time and then going away and coming back. Yep. And in those cases checking out some of those queer owned Airbnb or um, bread and breakfasts that might may or may not be on Airbnb, who knows. Um, and I'm but super this, excited. This, this website lists the price, the approximate price per night that they were at and stuff like that too. So it's a, it's just a nice little resource. resource. Yeah. According to Edge Media Network, uh, where to go in 2020, and this was written January of 2020, how Me uh, Merida, Mexico has become Mexico's LGBTQ sweet spot. Sweet spot. Yeah, I saw that one too. So so I guess there's there's far more like openly accepting or yeah. they'll announce themselves as a safe space, which is uh, something that I guess may not have been very common okay. prior to 2020. It seems to be like more of a new thing. Um and then, of course, there are, you know, places that are actually queer owned, which we could patron patronage. Yes. Um, so that's cool. But in my little dig to try to find like little places to go and things to do and gay shit and all this other kind of stuff, I ended up discovering um, a tiny little article on a on a queer blog that mentioned a scandal. A um, scandal. And um, I don't have tea, but we'll pretend. I, I mm -hmm. like I I'm tr I I am never gonna be nearly as fierce as um, RuPaul, so I can't say a scandalo as great as as uh, RuPaul. She knows, but you know what I'm saying. Um, but yes, I discovered an scandalo that I would I'm love to share because okay. it looked kind of fun. I'm ready. There in uh, November of 1901. 
Okay. November, November 17th, 1901. So, okay. so you know, long, <laughs> long, long time ago. Mm -hmm. There was a, a scandal that uh, would be somewhat of the equivalent of, like, if someone... Like, they actually, the, the way I found it actually said, like, if, if Jared Kushner, Kushner, mm -hmm. you know, however you say his name, the the husband of the daughter of the president. orange. Oh, right. Orangeness. Orangeness. Um, Pumpkin. Uh, if someone at his, like, some, someone, like, kind of in his level, if he got busted in 1901 at a, say, a, 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 a drag ball. Oh. This okay. is the kind of level of equivalent okay. of this event. So this is called the Dance of the 41, or El Ballet de los Corrientes y Uno. And I'm terrible still with my pronunciation. I think um, I do know the story, but it's cool. So basically, an incident revolved around the illegal police raid. So the raid itself was illegal because it was in a private um, home in mm -hmm. Calle de Paz, which is, this is in Mexico City. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just a, it was just a house party, basically. It was just a house party. Mm -hmm. But when the cops broke in, they discovered uh, about 41 people, a group of men, half of whom, about 19 or so of them, were dressed in women's clothing, which mm -hmm. um, in a time where homosexuality wasn't openly discussed and things like that, mm -hmm. you know, we had to find community in very subtle mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. And we would have our these we would have our little parties, right? We would have mm -hmm. our drag balls or our the, the, the stories just like this. In they the could States. be they could be trans women or they could well. be trans folks, which we, we just had, don't we have had, language for it back right? then. You know, we had to all conjugate together. Yeah. You so know? this party that got illegally and raided by the police they ended up finding um 41 men half of whom were dressed in with women's clothing if they were dressed at all because there was a little bit of nakedness too well hey, you know it's, uh, hot <laughs> it's, it's hot down in mexico it's, it's pretty hot and so when you're, dancing, you're gonna get sweaty so the the cops were just like oh my goodness you know <gasps> like Touch i can't my i can't believe that uh, um you know this was happening, but mm -hmm. some of the levels of people that were arrested. So people were arrested because I, I guess, I guess we can assume based off the arrest that homosexuality was considered illegal, illegal at the time. Yeah. Um, but the, this, this person was the son-in-law of the then president okay. who was organizing the party. He was married to the daughter of the president and um and they had a child and everything like that so this is basically a reveal that this this person was either bisexual or gay and married okay. to a uh, a woman the the dance you know was raging people were having a good old time there was alcohol there was all kinds of stuff and there was wigs and fake breasts and you know adornments galore and all this other kind of stuff um people were arrested some of the people were Supreme Court justices. Uh, some of the people were like well known and in, in, uh, in politics. Uh, seven people were convicted uh, for which they are named, but most of the people were unknown. Like to this day, most oh, of them I'm were sure. unknown because it, they kept that kind of stuff quiet or they found or they had payoffs yeah. or it, things oh, like that. Right? If you're rich, themselves. there's two different there's two different laws, right? Yeah. Right. Right. Well, this leads to an additional raid, also I think considered an illegal raid, that happened a month later on December fourth, nineteen oh one, which was a group of lesbians in Santa Maria, yeah. um, where it didn't get as much attention because I guess people aren't threatened by lesbians in the way they were threatened by gay men in dresses. I don't know, but. Um, they it really up, is the same everywhere, isn't it? It like, really ooh, is. Like it's women so, together is so hot, man. It's so <laughs> disappointing to, and, and you know, it's not like I'm advocating for a whole bunch of lesbians to get beat up no. and raided on or anything no. like that. But it's really just like, eh, the, the double standard. Yeah, it's just that. So uh, this was considered one of the biggest um, queer scandals of okay. Mexico in history, uh, the Dance of the Forty One. A scandal. A scandal. So we can just say that if someone equivalent to a Jared Kushner, or however you say his name, 
was busted at a drag ball that he hosted in his father-in-law's presidential estate. So people <laughs> quite significant was at this party. Yeah, there was like Supreme Court justices. There was and they lawyers, only, there was politicians. And they only arrested and got the little people. The yeah, people I imagine were. it's just, you know, kind of some of the lower end folks that maybe couldn't buy themselves out because there were uh, there were several people arrested, but there was nine or uh, seven, uh, seven people. People convicted. convicted. Right. Yeah. So same oh, shit, different but, day. But still an illegal raid. So cops did the illegal thing, but also somehow convicted people of an activity that they would not have discovered had they not done an illegal raid. That's pretty good. Also, scandalo. Scandalo. So what I like about stuff like that, and this was just a stumble, like it wasn't even what I was actively looking for, because what I was looking for was just like general queer, like we had decided we were going to do something like kind of random queer facts for Mexico or something like that, which I guess this is a random queer facts um, right. of something that happened in Mexico. Um, but I guess I think I was thinking of it more like the way it would affect tourism or the way it would affect um, people from the community that we think we're going to be serving through this right. podcast. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I saw that story, I was just like, it's... I, I like to find out, like, what was the biggest scandal in different places and things like that. Like, what what would have been considered, like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe that you did, you know, that this kind of thing would happen. And it's so funny how often um, the history involves learning uh -huh. that someone was a homosexual. Right. Someone or in history was a homosexual or, like, sexual sure. deviant or a, has a kink or something like that, you know, like, Ben... Brent Franklin's got a whole slew oh, of kinks um, that we could learn about and stuff like that. It has to do underage people of certain yeah, skin type. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, like, you know, it's it's just one of those things where it's just kind of interesting. And and the I guess the way, the reason why it grabbed my attention, because it, 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 was, it was promoted as, what if Jared Kushner, and it was, like, that kind of a thing, like, was yeah. caught at a gay, dis you know, ball or something like that. And so I paid attention to it just because I was like, what does this have to do with anything? And then I clicked and, through it, and that's how I went down the rabbit hole. And it's so interesting because in the history of us, of me discovering more about me and the LGBT, you know, the, the members of my, our community, is that, you know, indigenously, indigenous speaking, like, throughout the, the world, homosexuality or different genders or more than two genders or what is like something that is so old like honestly it's what i say every time until white people got on boats the no, world was I'm, very gay right 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 i mean <laughs> i'm not no joke like that's like it's it's funny but not it's a funny in a hee hee way not a ha ha way like yeah. it's like like you know like for like if you just so hernan cortez okay 1542 okay uh, started his campaign in, and I apologize, internet, I'm still learning Spanish, but uh, Chowula, okay, which is now, oh, it's still that, like, okay. They said that um, homosexual behavior varied between region to region. So on Cortes' behalf, on his majesty, the king of Spain, all right, España, started uh, talking to locals and trans, and, you know, this is trans, like, this is from a translation of old, old, old Spanish. Um, established a rule in 1542 against sodomy. It was perfectly fine before that. Yeah. But also, like, like what happened that made someone decide we need to make a law about this? Well, um, it, well first, um, if you're talking about, like, in this particular area, uh, colonization from Espana. No, I mean... <laughs> Oh. Even from the colonizer perspective, like gay shit was happening before that. Sodomy I, itself is not necessarily just gay shit, but no. they write sodomy laws to prevent what they think is the only way gay people have sex, which is hilarious. I honestly speaking, I think a lot of it, like I was doing some research about randomly about the libertine uh, time in, in, in France, which was woo -hoo -hoo. <laughs> um, pretty much. I mean, it was months long like when they did carnival it's not carnival it was like festival or something like that months mm -hmm. months of debauchery yeah of the most elite most r the rich yeah the rich the people rich, can rich, do rich, whatever rich. they got they want to do but if you were somebody of a lower class middle class whatever death yeah right but 
in a way also it you know it othered right they're othering people so like they, they could usurp their power and then take their their yeah. land like but everybody everybody was doing it like yeah, literally. yeah so. i mean even like in 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 feudal japan because a lot of the samurai or the warrior monk class would spend you know months on end years on end away from home you know and so they had a a type of relationship between samurai you know men and things like that or and the monks as well they would have these sexual relationships that were yeah. you know probably not unlike like the boston marriages of mm -hmm. of you know um i guess that's the victorian era uh where you know two people of the same sex are coming together for what's more of like the convenience of of life type of thing whether mm -hmm. or not there was um whether or not they would have identified as homosexual or not, or they still viewed themselves as like, mm -hmm. if the concepts of heterosexual and homosexuality was happening at that time, right. if they had those classifications, would they have viewed themselves as heterosexuals who dabble when they're away from home because of convenience, you know, prison prison queer type of type of thing? Right. Or were, were they queer people who, you know, got this opportunity to be their queer ass selves when they were away at war but when they got home they had to be married to a woman so they could procreate and things like that you know plus the 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 romantic standards of that time would have been a lot different than what we view romance right. and stuff like that now as well right so and we're um, talking about this using the language that we have now. that we have today so right you go right. but so so that being a part of the culture a known part of the culture a part of the culture that is not even necessarily shamed away from in terms of teaching like we know mm. that samurai did this and yet currently they're mm -hmm. on the books there are so many anti-lgbtq laws mm -hmm. in japan and even so much as to say that there's like we don't have a word for it so, right you know i think there is i you there know, is. or something like that and i yeah, right. but but like the idea of trying to say like we haven't created this word because it, this thing doesn't exist this is more of the influence of outsiders or or whatever so and that's just me talking about japan because i'm a Japanese have, person you know but i have talked to people who are from the north uh south american uh diaspora it's like like not just mexico but you know something who explain like you're using language of of current times our people are in it. We didn't have this stuff. You shoved that. Not, yeah. Like not, not, they know, not me, but like the collective you, right. Yeah. Like you wouldn't have to us. over explain what is happening. If, 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 right. um, if there was, like, you know, two spirit or, or the equivalent of two spirit or, the equivalent people of or something like that, mm -hmm. you may have had a term for it. You may yes. not have, but you would have just collectively understood right. what was happening there. And it wouldn't have been right. a thing. It wasn't until the white people got on boats mm -hmm. And that happened in all around Africa. That happened, happened all throughout all Asia. Asia. That happened all that throughout, all throughout South America. the America. And they did have words for it, but after a while, what they didn't want to trust us with those words, right? Because, of course, we would use use that against them. Like, uh, 1580, uh, 1569, um, the official Inquisition in Mexico. Okay, uh, it was created in Mexico City by Philip II of Spain um same sex um same sex sexual acts was the prime concern and the inquisition inflicted stiff fines spiritual pen uh, penances public humiliations flogging for what seemed to be their version of the sexual sins however if you go back and look at historically you know before we were even writing stuff down because of that language wasn't written it shows that same-sex marriage or different gender, there were more than just three genders down in this area hundreds of years before Spain showed up. Yeah. And it's amazing how quick with colonization that something that was normal becomes mm -hmm. unnormal and immediately internalized by that, that um, population that, you know, got victimized. Um, because you see it in, in a lot of places in Africa too, where um, the the way the the colonization messed up those types of relationships and now it being assumed that africa has extremely homophobic Phobic. and most of that comes from colonization Trauma. because before that most of that was not the case it, there were many not all but many Horrific. many tribes in which 
you could have multiple gender yes. relationship or access to yes. multiple people, polygamy, or and what we're what calling polygamy we now. To them, that was, tra- I mean, trauma on trauma yeah. on trauma on trauma. And, uh, you know, hurt people hurt people, right? Yeah. So, like, that, you know, now, you know, it's such a knee-jerk reaction. But it's like, it, it, I guess the case in point internet is because I just literally had a conversation with somebody who was trying to have a better relationship with their daughter this week. I was talking to Charmaine earlier about, about this, like they, they were talking about how like, you know, transgender, a lot of LGBTQ stuff, it's a new fad. I'm like, no, it's new to you. That doesn't make it new. It's been around since way longer than like it was, it was here before even America was a thing. I mean, there's so much evidence to show even like ancient Egypt, ancient, you know, Egypt. ancient China, China. There's, there's places ancient all Japan, over. Ancient before Japan, before like Japan, ev- yeah, everywhere. There's all kinds of versions of this, and and you know sometimes that is, um, I mean, shit. Even the Greeks, and in, in the ways that the Greeks did it, it was mm-hmm. an admiring of the male form. Yes, it was. So was it homosexuality and heterosexuality, and everybody just kind of played within that, or it was just just that like you just appreciated shit. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that shit looked gay and sometimes it looked straight. I don't fucking know. <laughs> like, I don't I don't have the language that they used or the intent that they had behind the words right. that they used back then. But we can definitely say historic, his, you know, history is gay. And um, mm-hmm. it wasn't until white people got on boats that that shit started messing up. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so, like, now you have places like the United States or where we're moving in Medida that are having to sort of build from scratch. Yeah this environment and community like and literally like would we have needed community as bad if this was just fine if it was just normal and you could pair off any way that you wanted to leave people alone leave people alone and mind your own business Mm -hmm. but because that isn't the case we have to find these safe places and we have to actively tell people you know this is a safe place to go this is not a safe place to go um the for for folks who may not be familiar with the green book and Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Please don't refer to that movie when I'm talking about this. Uh, (laughs) uh, The Green Book was a book that um, that kind of over time grew out of the necessity for black travelers to be able to know where to stop, where to eat, where to go pee, where to Mm -hmm. rest, where where to sleep on their drives um, throughout the south and up into different parts of North Chicago and um, and Boston and things like that. And um, and I know that I know that for some reason people seem to think there's this hard line across the United States and anything below it was racist and anything above it wasn't. Uh, that is not the case. There was also enslavement in the north as well. But even for the people in the north that were maybe abolitionists in some way, shape or form, that doesn't mean that they were ra- they were anti-racist. They just probably probably didn't like the idea of enslaving humans in some way, shape or form. Yeah. So there was always sundown towns. There was always lack of safety. Well, we're, what I think part of what we're trying to do on this travel scale of ours is kind of the, the, the rainbow version of that too. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, for me as a, you know, mixed black Asian person with a queer identity, I want to make sure that it's safe and, and for all of my intersections, but, yeah. um, but generally when you're a foreign traveler, there's just an awareness that you have to have that's a little bit different from being in your own country. We may not be always safe as queer people here in the United States, but in the way in which we might not be safe in other countries would be completely different to us. And yeah. we could potentially commit crimes that we don't realize yeah, are crimes in those areas. Um, and so you want to make sure that you you don't just travel willy nilly um, or try to hide it or something like that, you know, while while you're traveling. And, you know, you and I have talked about um, the fact that while we are queer identified people, we do currently have cis male partners. And I'm um, white. I mean, I know if you're shocked. So. <laughs> I, you know, I'm polyamorous in my, in my mm-hmm. partnership, so we're not always Mm-hmm. exclusive you know we you know we sometimes have other partners uh but that's also something i have to look into is mm-hmm. is it illegal to quote yeah. commit adultery in yep. other places in the places that we end up going and stuff like that mm-hmm. and what does that that's... look like how do we explain that right. if we're caught with another partner Got... you know things like that i mean that's why we t- i took bali off the list i had bali and other parts of indonesia on the list to check out but now after they've just yeah. had a slew of new laws put in place where even same sex couples, if you're not married, you're going to jail. The, oh, so you can serious. be same sex if you're married. 
But if you're not married, you go to jail. Like so, if you're if you're if you're not married and you're shacking up with somebody mm-hmm. and living with them, gay or straight, gray or straight. Now, okay. now, granted, gay is more of a sure. But sure. even if you're straight, that's a no go. Mm, so if you're not ma- if you're not married right now, you need to be very careful where you travel in Bali, in particular, and Indonesia. That's so crazy because you you know that this wasn't something that no, they would have cared about. Before. A lot of like it's just like in America and other. We're not the only place in the world where we are traveling backwards in in time. Yeah, Fascism yeah. is is trying it's very hard yeah. to, to 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 take over. We we if we don't learn from history, sorry for my little PSA, everybody. But if we don't learn from history, we are doomed to repeat it. I mean, we're we're always repeating it. I we we yeah. we must not be learning or anything. No. But well, my 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 type uh, my we have a problem with learning and accountability. <laughs> it's um, not our so, strong point. So well. that's pretty much it for this episode. Like I said, yep. we ended up going a longer than um than originally uh, promised on. I'll but not bad. Part. We didn't do bad. We didn't not do bad. two hours. Um, so, uh, one of the things that has recently happened is we moved our podcast over from my previous podcast host over to anchor, uh, anchor is a free podcast hosting site, but what it does do is give us opportunities that we don't have on our paid, uh, hosting site. Right. One of those things is to leave us a voicemail. You can actually interact with the show by going to anchor.fm slash queer far pod. You can leave us a little voicemail. So if you have questions about traveling while queer, while black and brown, while marginalized, while disabled in any way, shape or form, uh, go ahead and leave us a message and we will potentially use it on a future episode of Mm -hmm. Queer and Far. Um, Or if you just like something or you want to learn more about something or you want to say, hey, check this out, send us those messages. We'll start interacting with those because that will be a lot of fun for us. That would be fun. Um, So please check us out on anchor.fm slash queer far pod interact send us messages listen to our episodes that way if you're if you're listening to the audio only because uh, that'll that'll help and they'll send a video version like we do on youtube directly to spotify Ooh. from it which is something that was a service our other provider did not have do. so i'm excited about it it'll take me a couple weeks to get everything kind of up and running it's, it's mostly working right now but we just need to like get more downloads until we can activate some of those services um but i'm looking forward to growing the show through that new service because it'll be a lot more interactive for us mm-hmm. and uh and that's what we want we want people to actually engage with us because otherwise we're just talking to each other and recording it which is fun and we like each other. <laughs> we do but like each other. We want to. We want to have more. Um, I don't know, like those the, that ball that you know. We, we want to have a nineteen oh one um, a scandalo ball. A scandalo um, ball. It would be, <laughs> can we call it that? A scandalo ball. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we probably need another word for uh, ballet. <laughs> I guess ballet dance, right? Um, Whatever. So yeah. Also, I think I'm going to challenge us something, and then we'll and then we'll go we'll go by. Okay, we'll go away. Okay, bye. We're ready. We need to start incorporating what Spanish we know. Okay. A little bit more, because we need to start speaking. We need to okay. start speaking. You're right. You're Which right. Which is why I've said escándalo like 40 es- times on this episode. So I'm going to. Uh, um. Uh, yeah. Now I'm on the spot, and I can't. Do it. <laughs> I mean, you can make it easy and just say adios or adios, hasta luego. Um, and then next time, amigas. next time we'll come up with like something we can say in Spanish or just start replacing random words. Like now I only say hamburguesa because I made hamburguesa in the house the other day. And so now that's the only way I'm saying it. Como se dice internet en español? Fuck if I know. I, no <laughs> I will. We're gonna, no se. Because I could, I'm like, you know, hi, internets. Yeah. Hola, we'll, internet. We'll start incorporating a little that. bit that's more a good, Spanish so that over time we can uh, we can start feeling more comfortable. Yeah, Bordis is loving it. He loves making, he loves going into places and be like, I'm going to order food. And they're like, 
<laughs> I'm, I appreciate his enthusiasm. Tristan is just stressed all the time. Like, we were at a bookstore earlier, and he picked up this Spanish to English dictionary that was, like, this thick. And he was just like, this is all the knowledge we don't have. And he just kept <laughs> flipping pages going, I need you to absorb how much knowledge we don't have. I could pick up the same thing on the English dictionary, and I, I will know I'm less saying. Than I'm okay. saying. It's just an accident that I think I know enough. Hasta luego, Internet. Hasta luego. Hey. Oh, we're, we should learn how to say we're waxed. Oh, we're vexed, waxed, and packed. Vaxed. Let's go. I'll learn. I'll, we'll figure it out. We'll, we'll figure, figure it out. out. We, so we can start love you guys. Next time. See you <laughs> Bye. Later. Bye. Bye. Queer and Far is a main hustle media podcast, produced and edited by Charmaine Fury. Co-hosted by Charmaine Fury, a.k.a. The Blazin' and Blurred, and Shay Nanigans. Music is Big Band Savage Jazz by Pine Groove. If you like what you've heard on Queer and Far, please subscribe, rate, and review on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. Main Hustle Media. Turn your side hustle into your main hustle.